Brother in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. I'm very happy to be joined by my friend, Father James Maudsley. Father Maudsley, it is a joy and an honor to have you on Meaning of Catholic. Likewise. I've been uh, talking with you for, uh, really, we, we met at the CIC in, um, what was that, 2022, I think? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we've just been talking on and off, and uh, I'm just really excited to talk about your books because I they have just been incredible to read. I'm still reading through them. Yeah. Um, and uh, before we get into the main topic, which is the Torah, I, I noticed that you have a new project on the way. Can you tell us about that? Um, you, ha you have to remind me what it is, but I hope it's to do with the Good Friday the Vespers? Liturgy. The Vespers? Oh, yeah. The um, metaphysics of love. So the Holy Eucharist hidden in Sunday Vespers. So basically, you know, the church has fallen away from studying metaphysics and this has detached us from reality and the world. However, the Holy Eucharist, it, it all metaphysics converges in the Holy Eucharist because it's the fullness of being. And it's a thing of such beauty that I believe it's present, hidden, as it were, in the five Psalms of Sunday Vespers and the structure of Vespers. Um, and that, so I want to explain how the Psalms are teaching about the uh, presence and the fruits of the real presence, and also the metaphysics behind that and how that explains why the world is falling apart if we don't adore the fullness of being. If just one hint of it, if you read Psalm 113, which is the fifth Psalm on Sunday Vespers, um, it says, may they become like that, that they worship and the enemies of God who are worshiping idols made of wood that have eyes that do not see, ears that do not hear. They have feet but cannot walk. These will be the humanoid robots that like your iPhone, they have a camera, but they can't see. They have a microphone, but they can't hear. They Siri can speak, but she can't really articulate a thought. And wow. if you worship those, you become like them. But if you worship the Holy Eucharist, because God speaks of the um, the hills bucking like gambling like lambs and the river Jordan turning back at the presence of God. Uh, so God, his presence, creation exalts in his presence. You know, the rivers and the hills have the sense to say, wow, God is here. But human beings, if we worship idols, we lose our humanity but, and we become like these dead things that we worship. And if like creation is properly ordered and worships him who made it, we become like him. Anyway, that's a a preview. Wow, that, that sounds incredibly deep as usual. But I'm, I guess, I'm, so, I'm so, go, go ahead. Sorry, I keep interrupting. Sorry. Quite all right. The, the, the fifth book in the series is quite hard to handle this you know very much about the most controversial issues that are um but i don't want the book series to end on that it has to end on a, a note of truth and beauty there might be one other in the pipeline about the new testament how to fiat looks the light that comes through christ but this one of vespers is just meant to be a thing of uh, beauty and contemplation Okay. Well, that that's that sounds fantastic. Okay. So it is going to be a part of the new old series. So it'll be sort of the same. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what I love about your new old series is, well, here here's the books here. The new old series, what I love about it is that it's all about the old revealed in the new and the new concealed in the old, mm -hmm. as St. Augustine said. That's, and I love it because... I've always been since since back in the days when I was a Protestant, they told me to read the Bible and I read the Bible. I always loved so much of the Old Testament and Protestants have a strange um, uh, bias against the, the Old Testament in certain ways. But I, I love that you've brought out the, the, the immense depth of the Old Testament, which is already there in the patristics and the fathers. Um, so today we're going to talk about the Torah. This is um, this is part of our Bible reading group. This is uh, our lay penance sodality, where we offer up penances for cl clergy and seminarians as, as our duty as lay people in our crisis, offering this up in reparation for 
for uh, bad clergy and and also praying for good clergy, of course. Um, and one of the things that many of us do is we read the entire Bible every year. And this is according to the traditional office of Matins. In Matins, there is a reading from most of the Bible uh, the entire year. Uh, but what we did here with this this Bible reading program is that we added in all the gaps that that um, that weren't there. So we added in the books that weren't there and the chapters weren't there. But traditionally, at Septuagesima, the church begins to read Genesis. And this goes on. So this is the beginning of the Torah. Here we are at Septuagesima. Beginning of the Torah goes through Genesis. Uh, Septuagesima goes through Genesis. And then we go into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, all the way through the Torah. And then into Paschal Tide, it goes into Joshua, Judges, and uh, first, second Samuel, first, second Kings, first, third, fourth Kings, as as they are called in the Septuagint. Um, so this is a, a great moment to join the Bible reading group. If you've never read the entire Bible, uh, this is a great time to jump in, starting at Genesis. Genesis, as we're about to discuss, really lays the foundation for everything. That's why it's called Genesis. Um, Tim, this is the best Bible study program I've seen for to a one year cycle. It's so Catholic to tie it in with matins. There's a reason that it, it, Genesis is preparing for Lent. We're preparing for the new Adam in the resurrection, right? So we need to think about that. And Isaiah at the beginning of Advent to prepare for the, the, the virgin birth and the light to the Gentiles. It's so beautifully put together by the church over centuries. And now you've given a, a cycle to read the Bible in a year. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's really it's really been great because I mean there's different uh, there's different ways to do the Bible in a year but I love this because it really helps I mean it's totally connected with the liturgical cycle so it, it really as you get excited for the next liturgical season and you're sort of moving with the rhythm of the church you then find that next part of the Bible that's that's connected to it so it's it is just an it's an exciting an exciting way a prayerful way because obviously we we need to. Uh, prayerfully read the Bible as spiritual reading, not like the Protestants do, where it's merely an intellectual exercise studying the Bible. As Catholics, we have to prayerfully read the Bible. And this is what I love about your works, um, because it's it's a, this spiritual theology of the scriptures is what you have in your text. So let's talk about your books. You have, so the new old series starts with, I'm going to, I'm going to, make myself big so everybody can see this so it starts with adam's deep sleep the passion of jesus christ prefigured in the old testament and then um what's number two crushing satan's we've got crushing satan's head crucifixion to creation and then we have if you believe moses volume one and two the conversion of the jews as promised in the old testament so uh, let's just start with um, the first three for a minute. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the theme of Adam's deep sleep, how that gives us a key to the Torah and the whole Old Testament? To show that the passion of Jesus Christ was foretold from the very beginning in, in so many ways in the lives of Adam and Noah and Abraham and then the other patriarchs and prophets so that we know this is where history is going to tend and from which the history post-crucifixion can grow. As, as the last two books are, if you believe Moses, because Jesus said, you search the scriptures looking for me. But if you believe Moses, you'll accept me because he spoke of me. He, he wrote of me. And then in Acts 26, St. Paul says that he is teaching nothing but what is in the law and the prophets that Christ should suffer uh, rise again and show light to the Gentiles. And then at Acts 28, he says it again, that he in Rome from morning till evening, he's showing Jesus Christ in the law and the prophets. So I'm thinking where in the law do we read about Jesus suffering and rising? And you can read the whole of the law, the Torah, and miss it. And yet Paul spent hours and weeks and months expounding on the passion of Christ from the Torah. Now, I, I believe the teaching that Jesus gave to his disciples after he rose, they obviously discussed it all the time. And a lot of that is what the church fathers give us. And so St. Augustine, St. Jerome tell us that Adam's sleep 
prefigures the passion of Christ. Remember when Jesus raised the little girl from the dead um, and he said, she's sleeping and they laughed at him because they say she's dead. And when Jesus said, Lazarus is sleeping, they're thinking, no, he's dead. So when God says sleep, it means what we think is death. And he's trying to tell us, you're going to wake up from it. We know we wake up from sleep. Well, we're going to wake up from death to the final judgment. Um, so Adam's sleep, deep sleep, when Eve was taken from his side, God's word inspired through Moses saying sleep. He's actually talking about a death and it's the death of his son, the new Adam on the cross, which is by the tree of life. And so Adam's waking up to see his bride is like Jesus Christ rising from the dead and beholding the church, both in Our Lady, who had faith and charity, so she is the whole church. And then when the apostles came to have faith and enlivened by, he, he breathed on them. He, he's seeing the birth of the church. So he's seeing his bride. Um, and Adam didn't suffer when he was put into a sleep. But the exact same word, quite a rare word in the Old Testament, I think it only comes five or six times, is used for Abraham when he had a vision. And it said a dread terror and darkness descended on Abraham in the midst of this vision. And it invaded him like an oppressive force and god's explaining how for 400 years his descendants will suffer but then enter the promised land and so it's like he's experiencing the suffering then his descendants will and then the promised land is heaven so the church follows also the passion of christ the vision abraham had do you remember when he cut the calves and the birds in two pieces and walked and walked between them and he saw a furnace and a lamp the furnace stands for the blessed trinity because god is a consuming fire and the lamp is jesus christ the, the light of the world so the covenant he in the covenant he was making with god in the blood of animals he had a vision of another covenant which is made between the trinity and the god man and that's why it's an eternal covenant that cannot fail because both sides of that covenant jesus and the holy trinity and jesus is on both sides is perfect they're perfect they're never going to break it whereas the covenants made with moses was broken was not kept and the blood of animals cannot save it needed to be the blood of christ so and this abraham was in the same mysterious sleep as adam should, should i carry on let, let me ask you one question which is the uh the pre-fall nature, first of all, the thing that struck me first when I started reading your book was that Adam's deep sleep is obviously, that is before the fall. So he has a sleep that's prefiguring death, but at the same time, death is a result of the fall. So there's a sense that it seems that there's this, um, you know, pre-fallen sleep that's sort of a, a, a good sleep that's not yeah. associated with death. Can you tell parse out a little bit of that? We, we can think uh, that J Jesus, of course, went to the cross sinless as Adam fell into sleep sinless. Uh, yes. And it was willed by God. Um, the Kabbalah tells us and, and the um, Jewish Apocrypha that Adam was androgynous before that sleep. And this is false. It's total garbage. If anyone tells you that the male and female were both contained in him and then the female part separated out, it, it's to totally overturn the cosmos. Adam is a man, the full and perfect man before the fall. And that Eve coming from his side, the, the rib, it's the same word used for the sides of the Ark of the Covenant, for the altar of incense, even the chambers, the side chambers on the temple in Jerusalem. So you have this word, which means it surrounds the, the man's heart, the presence of God, as it were. So hence the Ark of the Covenant or the, the temple. It has these ribs around it, these sides. 
and the word for built up that he built Eve out of this, it's the same for um, Noah building the ark, first Enoch building a city, Noah building the ark, um, and that Abraham building altars. So it's building up, in fact, the city of God. Uh, if we can, I'd like to get into this <laughs> excellent book. And you talk about Adam and Eve, how Adam should lead his wife to true cultus, to true worship. That's his job as the head of that family. And if his wife is submissive to him, this is a great icon for the children to learn about the submission of creation to God their father. So the, it, that's what was planned from the beginning and that's what a Mary as our mother shows us this perfect submission, the new Eve to the new Adam so that we can be led to God the Father. That God teaches us through persons. It's in the Old Testament. So many persons that we meet because we can relate to persons and their stories speak even to children. So another thing I loved about your book, you're not just you're telling us history about the spiritual forces behind the political turmoil and social changes in history. Because most people, when they write history, they can't make head and tail of it. They have to impose their story on it. But if we accept this priority of the spiritual, this fight of good and evil and redemption, then you can understand history, the city of God and the city of man. So you, you talk about the coin and the kitchen and the king as representing the economy and then the family or society and then government. And those latter terms are all abstract. It turns someone off, a lot of people off, when you talk about politics. But talk about the king or the coin, they have something incarnate. Talk about the kitchen, you have something domestic in your home you can relate to. And this is how God works, I think. He gives us things we can relate to, like the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in certain ways. It's far more interesting for most people than an abstract theological treatise which you need for the theologians yeah but god couldn't communicate with his children like noah's ark everybody can get the story of noah's ark mm -hmm. right it's and god wrote that into history he, because he knew this is a, a parable that's going to speak of the church so why is the same um word for building the ark by noah is the word god used to build eve out of adam because he's building the city of god that's the growth of Eve who, who comes from Christ's side on the cross through the blood and water is the church. And it's built up through the generations, born of my bones and flesh of my flesh, so that through baptism and the Holy Eucharist, we partake of the nature of God through the sacred humanity of Christ. And how is God going to communicate this? Um, obviously, at the time of Moses, they don't have the, the theological vocabulary. But God doesn't need to. He can just present us with the matter, with the animals and the trees and the fruit and the serpent, whatever, these themes. And they have a form behind them, which is the spiritual meaning. So in Romans 2, 20, I think, St. Paul's saying to the Jews, you boast about having the law. He says, you have the embodiment of the law, the morph, morphosin, I think, in Greek, or form in Latin. Mm -hmm. um, of the of the knowledge and the truth. So you have the embodiment of the knowledge and the truth, which is the exterior, the letters of the law, but you're not penetrating through to the meaning of it. And so I think that's what St. Paul was teaching the Jews in Rome and elsewhere, and it's what the church fathers teach us, the spiritual meaning of Adam's deep sleep is the passion of Christ. Yeah, I love what you mentioned uh, with our mutual friend at Fonde Radio. You mentioned how the Psalms say, I will open my my mouth in parables which have been from the beginning. And yeah. how that's such the immense miracle in the Old Testament, in the Old and New Testament, is this how God can God can tell these stories that he's intimately in part of these stories. These were these are history, but they're also being told as stories, as history. And then they're telling an even bigger story. It's amazing. Let me let me ask you this. Um, now, should you... I close my window? It's flapping about there. Oh, okay. Oh, sure, sure. That's fine. Um, the uh, so Father Maudsley, you uh, you were in solitary confinement. You were in prison for 
a number of, I'm not sure if it was years, but you were year just and reading half. the Bible. Year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, and you were reading the Bible. And can you give us some spiritual tips? How can we read the Torah for spiritual profit? Um, can you give us any, any advice on doing that besides already all these different symbols? Mm -hmm. How would you advise us? That was the first time I'd read the Bible cover to cover. And, and when I went, the last time in prison was more than a year. So I could read it a few times. I think I got nothing of the prefigurations. Re reading the Bible cover to cover more than once. I think I understood nothing of that. And yet there's enough um, goodness and truth communicated on, on the moral level, for example. Mm -hmm. the, or the way the faith strengthening our faith how god defends his people how in the the book of judges he keeps raising up a savior for them no matter how far they go astray they then have to return to him and say god we've we've strayed help us and he always does and this this helps me ever since when we see the crisis in the church to think god's just waiting for us to return to him that's all and then it's he'll he'll send us the saints that we need. So let's trust him, return to him. So I, the, the there were also that first time in prison. It was just a three months. I think I skipped parts of Jeremiah and Ezekiel because I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't make head nor tail of it. Um, and then when I went back to prison a year later and read them again. The, the lights had come on and it was amazing so i would recommend to people persist persist with reading the scriptures you're not going to get it all first time nobody's going to get it all in their lifetime anyway we should be reading it daily and gradually you go into it and then you have these aha moments and then reading the fathers they give us the keys to interpret it in fact uh, the new testament gives us a lot like saint paul talking about the new adam and old adam and yet you can just breeze past that without realizing how much it contains um so i'd, I'd say to people read it every day or at least five days a week ideally every day and persist persist and if once you've got to the end you if you want to take a break of a couple of weeks or a couple of months okay read other spiritual books or read the fathers but then go back to the scriptures um and you will discover more and more and it 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 strengthens us um i think in a way that every part of the bible touches every other in in, in, in with the holy eucharist in the real presence jesus is there whole and entire in every fragment or particle this is a property that's impossible for material it, it can only be for a spiritual substance to be able like your soul your soul has no parts it's perfectly simple like all the powers of the soul are present in all parts of the soul except it doesn't have parts right so all the truth of the scripture as much as anything that is contained by words written words or spoken words can have all these layers touching each other you can almost whatever the scripture is for the the mass that day for example there will be something there that god is addressing you for your life your circumstances for that moment if which is why i like your cycle for reading the scriptures in a year because it's liturgical it's uh, more um submitted to god to his inspiration or helps guide through the holy spirit how we should listen to his word and he, he will he will find the different ways that when he talks about how he laughs at his enemies, mm -hmm. you know, they conspire against him and he laughs at them. Sometimes it's good to read that. When the enemies Absolutely. are getting you down a bit, and then you yeah. remember God's laughing. He's laughing. Yeah. They have yeah, no that, chance. Yes, I, I quite agree with that. Um it's it's good to have some laughter from God against the enemies of Christ. Um, yeah, I think that's that's great advice, persistence, because going through the Torah can be a little difficult, especially after you get through Genesis and, and the first half of Exodus, then it starts to get a little difficult. You're going through a lot of details, especially in the Leviticus. It's it's and so it's a great thing to do in Lent to persist through this. 
Go through it. Even if you don't understand, you're going to understand. And even just offering up that reading to Almighty God, saying, I'm worshiping you, I'm seeking wisdom, even if you don't understand everything because it's difficult sometimes. But uh, creation explains how St. Bede says the tabernacle shows us Jesus Christ in the church. Mm -hmm. So when you read through Exodus and Leviticus and you're thinking, why am I reading all this repetition about the building of the tabernacle? Persist with it. And then if you read St. Bede or I've got extracts in crucifix to creation, it's then a joy to read about the tabernacle. You think, wow, the tabernacle is an image of all creation. It's also an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In her, God comes to dwell. Um, And the Garden of Eden also as this uh, perfect creation is modeled in a similar way to the tabernacle. And it has the liturgical truths in the Garden of Eden. And the tabernacle is obviously full of the liturgy as the temple would be. And that's showing us the life and soul of Christ. Uh, So, but we need to read it when we find it boring and then God will reward us with these insights through the fathers. Yeah, it's it's a lot like the spiritual life when we're trying to uh, excel in prayer. God gives us, I was just reading that recently in one of my spiritual books, how they were talking about how God gives us this dryness because Mm -hmm. he's purifying our attachments. And this, there can be some dryness when we get through some of these difficult things in the Holy Scripture. Um, Can you tell us about some of the, so let me ask you about number two. The Virgin Mary's victory over the Antichrist foretold in the Old Testament, crushing Satan's head. Uh, what are some of the parables of the Old Testament which foretell Our Lady? Well, from Genesis 3, 15, you know, God promised the seed or the woman. And um, there's a, a certain happy ambiguity whether he will crush the serpent's head or she will crush the serpent's head. Depending if you read the Hebrew, the Greek or the Latin, um, it's he or she. And even the Hebrew is even, for the Torah, the the word for he and she is the same um, in the consonants. And they don't put the vowels in until a thousand years after Christ into the Hebrew text. And then from the book of um, Joshua onwards, they distinguish the he and she with the second consonant. So I think God was being deliberately open that it's actually Jesus acting through Mary or Mary living in Jesus that crushes the serpent's head. And then shortly after that, we'll in the book of um, Judges, we read of Jael smashing a tent peg through Sisera's head. And then after that, the, the woman of Thebes throwing a millstone down on Abimelech's head. And then later in, I think it's book of one of the book of Kings, um, a wise woman of the city of Abel throwing a, a re- rebel's head over the city walls who was trying to take over the city and the kingdom. In fact, well, she she got a mob to do it. Yeah. Um, and each time they take it, like Judith cutting off the head of Holofernes. Right. It, you ha- keep having these women crushing or removing the head of someone who the more you look into the different cases, they prefigure, prefigure the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. This is actually amazing. How many stories do we know from any other culture where it's a single woman who saves the day, but very often engaging her people in prayer and penance or whatever. Um, And she's gone right for the head of the enemy. Yeah. It is definitely preparing us for Our Lady and the, the promise that she will crush Satan's head, who is the antichrist because satan he doesn't have a body on earth he doesn't have a mystical body Mm -hmm. all his parts are scattered like dust he can't integrate them as christ truly integrates us into his body and yet he has um, agents on earth people who seek to do his bidding for the short-term reward he'll give them and the one who will be most perfectly possessed by satan at the end the antichrist he kind of represents the head of Satan's plans. And I think he will be defeated by those Catholics who have a Marian devotion, who live as Mary, the humble of this world. Um, 
will be exalted in crushing the enemy. And it, if a lot of those stories, there's two enemy figures, and one is remote, like King Nebuchadnezzar, and Holofernes is his general actually wreaking slaughter in the world, cutting down the sh shrines and temples of all the people and enslaving the people and then coming to Israel because he wants to do the same to Jerusalem. This is a figure of the Antichrist destroying all religion to say you will bow down and worship my king Nebuchadnezzar, this distant God figure who is Satan. And yet he's defeated um, by by the woman through, through her virtue. That, that's that's incredible. I, I never thought about the fact that there's so much uh, female-led violence against the heads. Uh, that's yeah. it really it's it's very very striking. I guess pun that's a pun there. But um, here's a question. It seems to me I, I've read this a few times. Just that if we pay close attention to what happens in Genesis, we can understand the rest of the Torah and the, really the rest of the Bible. Um, why is understanding Genesis so important? What are some ways that we need to understand Genesis that help us understand the rest of the Torah? Um, I, I think because the, the principle of a thing contains the conclusions, St. Thomas would teach us or any logician. Yeah. But once you have the premises set out, the conclusion is inevitable. So in the head of something, in a sense, you have the whole, like the king represents the whole country or Christ is the whole church. And then his body is only his body because it's conformed to him. It's like him. So Genesis is, as it were, the head of the book. Everything's there in the beginning. Um, I was speaking to Anthony and Rob on Avoiding Babylon about this, that the the first word of the Bible, Bereshit, the first letters can mean they either you have Bet, Resh, and Aleph, which are the initials for son, spirit, and father. Wow. And then Sheet is uh, the Lamb of the Cross. The Tav is the Cross. So it's that you, you, you have the Trinity, then the Lamb on the Cross. And then the next word is also Bara, meaning to create. But it also means Bar is the Son in Aramaic and Aleph, God, the Son of God. Uh, so Parashit Bara Elohim in the plural. God is plural. Et Hashemim ve'et Haaretz, the heavens and the earth, and that first Et, Aleph, Tav, is the Alpha and the Omega, the A and the Z, the beginning and the end. And Jesus said, I am the Aleph, uh, I am the beginning and the end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And it's right there in the middle of the first verse of Genesis, seven words. And then it, the joining the heavens and the earth is Ve'et. So to join heaven and earth, what do you have? But the Aleph stands for God and the Tav, the cross, God on the cross joins heaven and earth. And that's the truth of it. How do you join heaven and earth? God comes down to earth, takes on human nature, dies on the cross so that, which in Jacob's sleep, Jacob's dream of the ladder in Genesis is of the cross joining us back to heaven. So there's a way back to heaven through the passion of Christ. And Jacob anointed the rock at the foot of it. It's the, the rock stands for the altar even for Holy Mass, which is where we participate in the Passion of Christ, which brings us the angels ascending and descending. So they're ascending up, taking our prayers and our souls to God and descending down with graces in the Holy Mass. And um, so Jordan Peterson was giving a talk about the meaning of Jacob's sleep and how it, he, he, Jordan Peterson even saying it's all to do with sacrifice, but he's it's not been explained to him yet Yes, that's the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. This story of Jacob's dream is not a myth dreamt up by very intelligent people because it's an interesting story that speaks to us about sacrifice. It's actually a prefiguration of the passion and was always meant to be. So with, with the key to understanding Genesis, I think, is brothers. It, it's very much about brothers from chapter 4 with Cain and Abel. Then you have Noah's sons, his three sons. One brother laughing at his father's nakedness. By the way, Noah lying down drunk asleep is also a prefiguration of the passion of Christ. Saint Jerome says that the, the wine that Noah 
got from his vine. He was the first to plant a vine, like Adam the gardener, uh, that got him drunk, was God's vineyard that he planted. Israel made him suffer in that stupor of the crucifixion. And one of the sons laughed at his nakedness being exposed, and two of them reverently covered it up. So this is basically how we respond to the cross determines our judgment, curses or blessings, death or life. Then after the brothers, um, sons of Noah, begins the story of the patriarchs and Abraham. And there's, there's something to infer with the brothers of Abraham there. Then it's more explicit with Ishmael and Isaac, then Jacob, Jacob and Esau, and then Joseph and his brothers. And in every case, the younger does better than the elder. Like Abel was killed by Cain and Abel's name means in Hebrew, it means vain, vanity, empty. And the Jewish sages would say that Abel's life was empty because he had no children. But it can also mean rock if it's pronounced slightly differently. And I, I think Abel is showing us the rock of Christ who has joy and honor for eternity. You know, Abel was the first man who died. He's the wow. first man who died. And where do, you, where do you come closest to Abel? In the canon of the mass every single day where his sacrifice is remembered forever. And his, he has this glory of being the first one to prefigure Christ in the death, which was the sacrifice being killed by his elder brother who was jealous of his sacrifice, which is Jesus on the cross being killed by the elder brother who is the Jews in relation to the church. Um, out in the field, it said, they went out to the field, you can think out from where they hadn't yet even built cities, but this is standing for outside the city as Jesus was crucified outside the city. And that, well, I, I won't get into the field yet, but the, the theme of brothers and the younger overtaking the elder, it's all about the church overtaking the synagogue, the old covenant, the new covenant surpassing the old. And Genesis is telling us all about that. And Moses and Aaron, who are the next four books of the Torah, they're the two brothers who meet on God's holy mountain and kiss in a what I think is a liturgical way. It's the Pax at the mountain of God. We pray at the beginning of Mass, I'll go up to the mountain of God. And then all the family gathers there for a banquet. Um, it's like a prefiguration of the mass and the heavenly banquet and the brothers are reconciled even moses and aaron had their differences sometimes because aaron was jealous of moses and with mary and said has god not also spoken to us um as people want to cling on to a covenant what's been given to them instead of recognizing you no know, moses is the greatest one here the younger you know M moses was the one who revealed God's teaching to Aaron and then Aaron passes it on to the the people but Moses consecrated Aaron it's like Christ is the greater one so I'd, I'd say in reading Genesis look for the theme of brothers because God's talking it's all heading to the I think the reconciliation of Christians and Jews with the conversion of the Jews there's always there's hints with the like Cain perished but Ishmael and Isaac buried their father together in the end. And though Esau hated Jacob and wanted to murder him, in the end, they came together to bury their father. And Joseph's brothers were there together in the end, reconciled after this murderous hatred from them against him. He not only saved them all, but they buried their father. And I think this means they're, they're coming together in a re religious ceremony to honor the father. What well, that's holy mass. Yeah, th this is uh, this is getting into um, if you believe Moses, volume one. Um, this is I I just really love this text. One of my favorite texts about the Holy Scripture because it, it's really it's it cuts to the heart, cuts to the heart of of the whole history of the unit of the universe, and um, it, it, we're, so we're going to talk about that. So stay tuned for that. Um, and we'll get into, if you believe Moses, volume one and two. Uh, but for now, go and click. Do yourself a favor. This is These are great texts to read as we go through the Torah, as we go through the Old Testament. Thank you so much, Father Mosley, for coming on the show today. Thank you for writing these books. And so click the link below. 
Uh, Father Mosley, thanks for coming on the show today. And well, thank you for the Excellent. Well, stay tuned, everybody, for If You Believe Moses coming up soon. God bless. Amen.